Good morning. Thank you. It's Columbus Day today. Did anybody know that? <coughs> well, I thought it was sort of apropos, not only because it's a gorgeous, crisp fall day out there, uh, but because for many of us who have been working uh, and watching many of you in this particular arena, it certainly seems like re regardless of whichever version of history about Columbus you like to subscribe to, we would definitely put you uh, in the uh, pioneering uh, journey category of people who are testing some very uncharted waters, uh, making new discoveries, and uh, really forging uh, some very new territory. I'd like to welcome you. My name is Mylea Christensen. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Healthcare Quality Corporation, and we are thrilled and delighted that so many of you took the day or even took the week uh, to attend this very exciting training. Uh, I never miss the opportunity to do little polls uh, at the beginning of most of the things that we do. So quick question for you. Uh, before you signed up for this training, how many of you knew what the Patient-Centered Primary Care Institute was? Hi up there, hi, hi, this is exciting. So this is, this is after one year of work uh, on the Institute, so that is very, very exciting. Uh, for those of you who perhaps don't know uh, a great deal about the Institute, it really comes behind several years worth of work, uh, sponsored by the Oregon Health Authority, sponsored by contributions from the Northwest Health Foundation, uh, sponsored by many community volunteers who participated in almost two years of effort uh, to really create this vision for a new institute in Oregon that would bring together all stakeholders to really try to focus on the transformation uh, to make a primary care patient-centered home a reality in Oregon. So how many of you ever participated in any of the groundwork for that? Anybody here participate in a task force? There were at least eight of them. Uh, any of these groups? We'll see, it could be new, new territory for us to get all of you engaged and included uh, the next time out. But for the Institute, the key objectives of the Institute are to promote knowledge and sharing, to facilitate collaborative learning, to build capacity, and to create alignment. Uh, way before we met these wonderful folks who we'll introduce in a moment, uh, we were working on what was the most pro important part of the programming that we could provide uh, out of the gate for, for the Institute. And an interesting thing happened at about month four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. People started asking for help in behavioral health integration. And so we have an expert oversight panel, uh, over 20 members who help us make, we hope, very good and thoughtful decisions about what kind of technical assistance to provide. And so that group really at, encouraged us to focus on this area. Um, we selected Mountain View Consulting and we're thrilled that they are with us today uh, after considering many options and opportunities because we know that there's a lot of work that's taking place out there um, in this field and in this area. We hosted a couple of luncheons with experts from across the state to try to help to shape these workshops. Uh, this is um, the first of three that we're going to do uh, in various locations across the state. There are 40 uh, different practices who signed up. We were able to accommodate them all in this initial training. We are going to be very interested in your feedback and your thoughts about, you're, you're, the, uh, you're the, the first ones out of the training, so we'll be very interested in your feedback and very excited about you, how you can help us to improve. One other quick question, how many of you ever heard of Quality Corps before you signed up for this fine event? That is impressive also. I was at a group yesterday afternoon where only one person raised their hand uh, for there, but that was a completely different group, so that's very encouraging. We are a nonprofit organization. We're 13 years old. We're dedicated to improving quality and affordability for all Oregonians, and we are facilitating and sponsoring the activities of the Institute. We're delighted to be part of it. I'd like to welcome a guest who just arrived, uh, Cindy Kellner, way from the back. Um, Cindy is our uh, representative from the National Program Office of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a fabulous sponsor of Quality Corps, and we are very excited to have her join us for the day. She traveled from California to be with us. And with that, I think we're going to get started. Um, logistics, in case you didn't notice, the restrooms are right down the hallway on your left. Um, hopefully you found parking and you don't need to uh, get back out there to change anything. Sounds like parking was good. Uh, we are being taped today so that this session can be um, 
rebroadcast and shared with others. So uh, if anybody has any issues with that, please let us know. Otherwise, you might see your face on a, web a webinar soon uh, in another venue. Please don't hesitate to ask any of the quality course staff uh, in the back. Kate, raise your hand. Merida, there we go. Uh, you should know that uh, Kate and Elena, who I think might have stepped, or who's already at the desk, are, um, have poured hours of work into this. So if you get a chance to say thank you to them, uh, they've done a great deal of work to uh, set this day up and week up. So with that, Mountain View Consulting, a fabulous group, uh, a, a duo, a dynamic duo. Um, their firm uh, specializes in providing consultation, program impl implementation, training services for healthcare systems seeking to integrate behavioral health. We have been so impressed with both Patty and with Kirk over the last couple of months as we've um, uh, gotten ready for this training. We're going to let them introduce themselves to you, and we hope again it will be a great day and week. Thank you very much. Well, I'll let uh, Kirk start. Yeah, I'm Kirk Strassel. I'm a, a clinical psychologist. I've been working in integrated primary care since 1988 when nobody even knew what that term meant. One of the cool things about being in this uh, business right now, or if we did this workshop 10 years ago, there'd be one table. And this is sort of emblematic of how this has, idea has taken off. And we'll hope to let you see the rationale for why it's taken off and the time has come to do something about severing the neck and the body, the head and the body. It's not a good idea. I actually currently work at Community Health Center of Central Washington. That's a multi-site community health center system in Yakima. As a um, behavioral health consultant, you'll hear us use that term a lot today. So I practice what I preach. I'm not an egghead from academia somewhere. Um, I see 12, 14 patients a day. I mean, I'm, I'm in the trenches like everybody else. Um, we also are in our lingo in Washington, a patient-centered medical home, which is the equivalent of what <coughs> Oregon's PCPC, PCPC, yeah. So essentially we're, the alphabet soup has already started in this section. Anyway, I'll uh, look forward to uh, working with you today and fielding questions and also having lunch with the clinicians, I think it is. But, yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, I'm Patty Robinson and I've been involved in primary care behavioral health kind of work about the uh, same time frame as Kirk. I, we started in the 1980s, uh, part-time research and part-time uh, clinical work at Group Health Cooperative in Seattle. And it was our research work that led us into primary care because the primary care um, providers at the time were friends and the clinic was across the street and they kept saying, why don't you come over here? It's where all the patients are. And, <laughs> and we were like, Oh, but we're running these cool specialty groups on cognitive behavioral therapy, and we do it in groups, and you know, to improve our access. And but in our hearts, we knew that people were not showing a lot of times for our visits, individual and groups, and we worried about them, and we wondered where they were, and we knew our impact wasn't uh, like what we wanted it to be and that we had access problems in terms of getting people in. So uh, we started with um, the first study that I participated in as a clinician researcher was older adults and primary care. And so it was like, what can we do in the way of group services for older adults? And we're coming at you like a train, <laughs> you know, these days. So this is very important to be thinking about what can we do and it we offered eight different kinds of groups and had the the folks kind of evaluate them and in on multiple criteria and the favorite group was the group that I offered cognitive behavioral intervention uh, called the life satisfaction group and after I had delivered that to a lot of people at a lot of clinics but a whole lot at the downtown clinic in Seattle uh, the medical director uh, said, uh, you can't leave, you know, this is what all our patients need, more life satisfaction. 
And so he went to talk with the mental health chief, and so the chiefs did what chiefs do anyway. It kind of started a part-time service, and Kirk and I were out there and worked with Wayne Caton, uh, Mike Von Korf, and others on some studies that were um, quite pivotal in Kirk and I's career because um, they kind of put us into uh, the role of teaching and consulting with other healthcare systems, and um, we began a long-term affiliation with the United States Air Force, who are one of the first to get on board with integrated care, and they now have mandated uh, primary care behavioral health services in every military medical treatment facility in the world. And so um, just a very interesting to see a lot of expertise and effort put into it uh, by the military. Uh, we've also worked with the VA. Uh, we worked with HRSA, Bureau of Primary Care. <laughs> Kirk is trained in 100 or more, 100 or more FQHCs across the United States. Um, also, I've worked with Kaiser. <coughs> My favorite thing is really um, the clinical work, I think, all in all. So after a while being on the road and um, traveling and training and consulting, I said, I want to know really how to make this work with the underserved. And Kirk and I would moved to a rural area in um, Washington State to kind of assist with his parents as they were aging. And so I affiliated with Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic and worked in Toppenish, Washington for a six year period. Uh, the founding clinic, there were about oh, 17 full time equivalent providers, so a mix of uh, pediatricians, um, internal medicine, family practice, and OBGYN. And really, there were not any behavioral health services to speak of. Some for children within farm workers, but not really much at all for adults that came to our clinic because they couldn't get to mental health or they didn't qualify because of a lack of citizenship. So um, that was kind of my lab for about six years, and I worked with phenomenal providers. and. During that time period, I wrote the book, Behavioral Consultation in Primary Care, which has been used a lot um, to help people kind of like say, how do we do this? How do we, how do we get started? And um, then I've gone back on the road. So I've been working for the past seven years, uh, a lot with public health departments and been able to kind of see how does this, <coughs> how does this work in homeless clinics and that sort of thing so there's always more to learn and it's just so awesome that um, Kirk and I had this opportunity to serve in Oregon in this way as our one and only grandchild lives in in uh, lives about five minutes from here so <laughs> that's kind of brought us to our Oregon as part-time residents and we actually have a, a little uh, condo in Selwood so um, it's so nice to be a part of this huge transformation that's happening in Oregon, and I really feel like Oregon is, is doing it right, and you're really leaders, and I'm glad to be here to facilitate your start. And you're hearing that from a husky, so you can imagine how <laughs> <laughs> this runs. <laughs> I hear this coming out of my mouth. Is we need to get this on the video. They're video. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we'd like to start uh, with. Um, oh yeah, we we have to kind of uh, mention that the American Psychological Association is getting on board with integrated care, and recognized our company. Uh, with a Practice of Innovation Award in 2009. It was very slow to get on board, but it's getting on board now, so that's a good thing. Um, so today what we'd like to be able to do is really introduce a specific model. Uh, of course, a model is what? It's a group of strategies, so you can use whatever strategies you can uh, to approach implementation of this model. It's not like you have to do every part. 
but we recommend that you pursue as many strategies as possible because you're more likely to obtain the results associated with this model in research studies if you have greater fidelity to the model. Um, we will review that evidence. Uh, we'll then go kind of to just the kind of the ant level and look at the very details of a visit, um, the components, so you can better understand that. Um, we'll talk after the break. Uh, we take a break about 10:15, and after the break, Kirk will lead you through a readiness assessment in terms of where are we as a group. Um, in terms of moving forward and what are the barriers. And uh, then we have a guest speaker who will talk about kind of how he and his organization worked through the barriers over time um, and got to the point where they are. And then before lunch, we will um, help you um, develop kind of three next steps and a commitment to those next steps <clears throat> we'll also try to help you uh, find a sister clinic that, uh, so you have a connection with somebody that's kind of swimming in the same water, so you can check in with them a few times over the next six months to see how it's going in terms of uh, pursuing those next steps and sharing ideas. Um, yeah, and then in the afternoon, it's going to be... Um, more kind of uh, assessing your own individual skills as a clinician for working in this model and figuring out what it is that you don't know because that's the hardest <coughs> part, in, you know, figuring out that you don't know something so you can uh, put it on your list of things you need to learn. We will do some skill training in the afternoon, uh, particularly uh, skills associated with working as a team and skills for the primary care clinician and um, um, things that operational folks need to be doing as well. Um, of course, um, <coughs> we'll introduce the toolkit. Should be one on every table, one or two, one per team. And talk about the different elements of the toolkit. Now, the behavioral um, members of your teams We'll go through training Tuesday through Friday, become very familiar with the toolkit, and get a chance to practice a variety of uh, skills, not just clinical interventions, <coughs> although a lot of that, but also uh, how to influence the system of care and, and make changes and measure outcomes and that sort of thing. Big deal, <laughs> a lot to cover. Um, all right, so we want to know who's in the room a little bit and want you to know who's in the room as well. So um, how many people here are part of a, a single clinic? Wow, okay. So a, a system with just one clinic, about half, okay. How many are part of a larger um, system with multiple clinics? Okay. Yeah, so it's not, it's a few more in that latter group, um, but um, yeah, so a nice representation. How about the uh, size of your clinic? How many people in a small clinic say two or less PCCs? Okay, good. There's a lot of very small clinics out there that will need your help once you get this started, so. How about medium, like two to 10? Okay, quite a few. And larger, 11 or more? Okay, again, okay. And rural, how many rural clinics? So about half, yeah. We're gonna do this training in Bend too, and I think we're gonna pull some other people there, so should have good representation. And the rest are urban, suburban, Okay, and uh, how about uh, family practice clinics? So you see adults and children, you see everybody. <laughs> okay, and how about uh, pedi pediatric clinics? Oh, wow, so about half. 
and uh, other uh, more focused kind of clinics. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many of the clinics have a behaviorist or behavioral health consultant? Wow, awesome, okay. And then uh, how many are here looking to hire someone else's behavioral health? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to get them trained up, <laughs> kind of watch. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're in high demand. It's a good career field. I totally recommend it to you. All right, so let's dive in with that introduction. And uh, let me just tell you, in a nutshell, what the primary care behavioral health model is. It's really an approach to population-based mental health clinical care. So um, it is simultaneously co-located, collaborative, and integrated within the primary care clinic. So population-based care, population health perspective, very familiar to primary care. I mean, that's how primary care is delivered newer perspective for behavioral health providers because we've historically worked more in a specialty setting. So the population health perspective encompasses the ability to assess the health needs of a population. Does that sound familiar? I mean, that's patient-centric care, population-based care. I mean, that's, that's the the heart of the PCPCH uh, mission is to make it patient-centric. So what do you need? What do people need from the point of view of people? Uh, implement and evaluate interventions to improve the health of that population and then to provide care for patients. And to do so in the context of their culture, uh, given their particular health status, and their needs. So what we know about this approach is that it improves the health of a population and the health of individuals within that population. So it's definitely the way for us to go. But there's a lot of details in making that uh, shift in providing behavioral health care. And it's been said that the devil is in the details. But that being said, the goal of primary care behavioral health is to improve and promote overall health within the general population. So when you go back to Winding Waters Clinic, you know, your thoughts will be on how do I, as a member of the PCPCH team, um, improve the health of people in the community that I'm serving. And different perspective and will lead you in different directions. It's a very big mission and um, there's much to do. And there is uh, quite a bit of urgency, I think. So what is the urgency? Well, we've known since early 1970s that the de facto mental health system and actually chemical dependency treatment system in the United States is primary care. It's actually quite remarkable that that has been ignored for at least two to three decades. And now people are starting to kind of come back to some of those, even those early research studies, which were very clear. Uh, actually, I think it's a conservative estimate that half of people with psychiatric mor morbidities, psychological health problems, are seen in primary care because you'll see studies where they slice and dice the penetration into the specialty mental health system compared to the incidence of treatment by physicians of things like depression, anxiety, and primary care. It's more like a really conservative guesstimate would be about three out of every four people in the United States who have mental disorders or addictions are circulating solely in primary care. And I'm sure if you're working in primary care, you see this every day in your practice. Um, and they don't always identify their problems as being mental health or chemical health related. They'll often be coming in for somatic complaints like headaches, nausea, dizziness, insomnia, 
these are kind of the tickets in the door to uh, talk to somebody. My colleagues, uh, you know, we have a little comment field on our uh, EMR schedule, and they just say that's all hypothetical. You'll find out what they're here for when you open the door, right? So there's things that give you access to healthcare, and then there's what happens once you walk in the room. Uh, one of the things you'll see very clearly this being reflected in is in the prescribing practices in the United States. About 80% of all antidepressants are prescribed by primary care providers. Interestingly, psychiatry and psychiatric nurse practitioners only account for about 11% of all of the psychoactive medication prescribed in the United States. So also hospital specialists, ER docs, uh, subspecialty providers do a lot of prescribing. So the odds are if you're walking around with a, you know, psychoactive medication, prescription medication in your pocket, the odds are it's been prescribed. Overwhelming odds are it's been prescribed by a non-psychiatrically trained physician or a prescriber. Um, next. Was that it? Yeah. Okay, so... That's the water we're swimming in, and then here comes the Affordable Care Act, signed into law in 2010, and well, pretty well implemented at this point. Um, it's a comprehensive health insurance reform. Uh, it requires not only uh, PCCs to attend to the acute and chronic health care needs of patients, but also uh, encourages us, actually requires us uh, to better address uh, prevention. And when I look at the literature and kind of the trends in mental health with children, I, I can't think of a higher priority than for us to be working with an eye towards prevention of mental health and substance abuse problems in primary care. All the kids have to come there that's where they go to get their immunizations and they can't go to school without those. And there's so much that we can do if we begin screening systematically, not just at the well child visit, but really at all visits. Um, because we know we're more likely to identify psychosocial problems at visits with children that are non uh, well child related, but more uh, I'm hurting kind of related. Um, we're going to have a payment system based on value, so we're going to have measures, lots of huge requirements in terms of primary care, and then we're going to have millions of people that were previously uninsured being coming insured um, this week. Um, at the same time, we have a shortage of primary care clinicians. I think 45,000 shortage of, no, 65,000 by 2015. I mean, that is just huge. I mean, it's, uh, what are, it, when you kind of break it down, I saw one interesting article looking at what is panel size, given the Accountable Care Act, what is, should the panel size be? And I think, they were saying, um, if you did everything that the ACA is asking and um, you had a panel of 2,300, kind of, that's kind of the average across the United States, um, the PCC would be working about 21 hours a day. <laughs> well, that's not doable. That's not feasible at all. So we really do have to change uh, the mix of the team, and adding a behavioral health provider is just huge, hugely important in terms of getting the PCC able to, to work an eight or nine hour day and go home feeling good about what they do. And we gotta do that, or we're never gonna fill that shortage. We're not going to attract people into family practice residencies. They're gonna go elsewhere. Or we're not gonna be able to retain them. So we have to make a change. Um, 
So this is a, this is a picture I took at the uh, FedEx and so so <laughs> on October 5th. <laughs> and can you see what it is? It's a community board and it's cover Oregon. It's an uh, advertisement for the healthcare exchange. Well, this was on October, it's four days into it. And as you can see, the little tabs at the bottom are nearly all gone. So, I mean, it's really, it's urgent and it's good that you're here. So, um, it is totally uh, time for a change and we're here to help you with some strategies. So, it's also notable that that's Selwood. That's Selwood. <laughs> <laughs> That's Selwood, yeah. Well, we have musicians and artists down there, traditionally, you know, underinsured or uninsured, lots of young people. So, um, before the uh, strategies and how to do this, we'll talk a little bit about the evidence. I'm, That's always, you know, tell me how come I should do something first. Um, so let's look at the evidence. So when we look at the impact of delivering services according to the PCBH model on patient symptoms and functioning, we find broad-based improvements among family practice patients uh, seen two or more times, an average of about a little over two in these studies, and these are not small studies, these are big studies. And we see improvement not only in symptoms, but in functioning, and the way people are integrated socially into their communities. What's important about social integration or social support? It's probably the best single buffer in terms of mental health decline and physical health decline. Okay, so social health is very important. and. These changes were measured multi at multiple points over a two-year period, and the gains were sustained. So this is a pretty good testament to this approach. Um, the, um, the other thing is that we've had studies that measure uh, what are patients, are patients doing things differently? Are they using skills? that help them uh, create better life outcomes on a day in, day out basis, and they are. If we teach them in primary care, they learn, they apply, and that's why they can sustain their own gains. Uh, we also see that patients with more severe impairment benefit in this model of care. Um, they tend to use more sessions, and that's okay. Uh, but when we're there, we're accessible. They improve, and they actually improve faster than the people with less uh, severe impairments. We also see our patients being more satisfied with traditional um, models of care. Depression is a big problem. We know that anybody with a chronic disease that's depressed has a lot worse outcomes. Um, a review, a Schulberg uh, reviewed 12 randomized controlled trials looking at evidence-based psychotherapies that are adapted to primary care uh, are comparable in results to prescription medications and superior to usual care. And when you ask patients what do you want? Do you want to take medicines or do you want to learn to do something different? Most people, if asked that question, they would say, well, I want to learn something. I don't want to take a medicine that I have to take forever. So we need to be able to offer patients that choice. That's particularly important um, for people that have never taken an antidepressant because we know if we give them the behavioral treatment, Instead of the medicine, they're less likely to have repeat episodes of depression in the future. So that's all the reasons in the world to offer behavioral treatment as the first line treatment. Um, 
study by um, Serrano. Uh, this was in an urban uh, clinic, but they found reduced referrals to mental health when they uh, brought in a, a behavioral health consultant to work in primary care. Reduced referrals to mental health, only 8% referred. Better adherence uh, to evidence-based guidelines by the whole team and reduced prescribing of antidepressants. So more evidence. This is uh, the impact on primary care, so uh, our primary care clinicians. So how does it affect primary care clinicians? Well, first, uh, they're more able to detect behavioral health problems. I suspect they're very able to detect behavioral health problems. It's just that they don't have resources. And when they have a resource, it's very easy to detect and, and refer. Um, more able to use behavioral health interventions. Um, and less use of medications as they learn those behavioral interventions. Truly, um, the primary customer of the behavioral health provider in this model of care is the primary care clinician, and the patient is a secondary customer. So that's a good thing, and that's the reason why. One of the studies we did in primary care involved um, creating relapse prevention plans for patients with depression, and we put those in the medical charts. <clears throat> this was a randomized control design. Um, Eight months out, when we called uh, patients up and said, are you following a relapse prevention plan that's supported by your PCC? How many people in the control group do you think said yes? 32%. I mean, we didn't ask them to start creating relapse prevention plans for their control patients. We didn't even teach them. We mentioned it about five or 10 minutes. In a, in a lunch, our presentation, lunch hour meeting with the PCCs, they just saw it in the chart for their other patients and picked it up. So when we start to work in teams, it's absolutely amazing how quickly all patients start to benefit, not just those seen by the behavioral health provider. Better patient retention we developed a protocol It was four to six 30-minute visits, really about 20, 25-minute visits, because when we say 30, we mean complete the chart note and provide feedback. And we gave patients a choice of completing uh, four, five, or six. We found that 91% of the patients who came to the first visit completed four. That's huge engagement of patients. I mean, I think, um, what is that in specialty mental health? It not, not even close. I think it's like 40%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the modal, Sandy is right. Modal number of times a person goes to a mental health provider in the United States, one, one. So huge engagement. I think we, a couple of reasons. One, I think we've got it dosed right. It's, it's you know, not very long. It's manageable in terms of, you know, patients really do have a lot of things to do in their life <laughs> besides hang out with us. And it's accessible. It's same day. And it's where they go already. So we're making use of uh, the patient's strength in terms of reaching out to primary care as a source for, for uh, support and learning. Um, the studies haven't been done, but I suspect uh, they're in progress. We're going to see better uh, provider retention uh, in clinics that have behavioral health providers as part of the PCPCH home or PCPC home. <coughs> Kirk. Um, you want to talk a minute about what you do in your clinic in terms of tra training residents and what residents say when they graduate? 
I also want to just mention about the health care cost issue. If you look at the research that we've done at Group Health and around the world, when people are psychologically distressed, this, they don't even have to have a mental disorder or an addiction. They can just be in a bad marriage or not like their job. They immediately start using two times the annual amount of ambulatory medical services. So a very conservative estimate, I did a review several years ago with a physician from Kaiser Permanente on the cost offset. What is the cost impact of just letting people circulate without integrated care? And a conservative estimate is probably about 0.25 of the total annual health care bill, which last year was 2.2 trillion. If you multiply 2.2 trillion by 0.25, that's a basically how much money we're squandering by not being integrated. You could hire a lot of behaviorists and probably populate the entire medical system such that a doctor in anywhere could have a full-time provider and you'd still have several billion dollars left over. So this is a huge uh, financial consideration for the healthcare system because this reform is designed to bring healthcare costs down and it isn't just insurance companies that are going to do that, it's going to be smart design of delivery systems. Um, so our clinic, we have a freestanding medical residency program. We have a, what's called a 10-10-10 model, meaning we have 10 R1s, R2s, R3s, because you spend three years in residency. And what we're required to do for accreditation is we do five-year graduate surveys. So you go out, find people who were in your residency five years ago, and poll them, and basically you ask them, did we teach you the right stuff in this residency program? And this is actually a very common finding in all residencies in the United States because they're all kind of interconnected and they have a common database. The number one thing that family medicine physicians say they wish they'd gotten more of was training in how to deal with behavioral health issues. And the second thing is practice management. In other words, how to bill, code, play the insurance game with the number one thing consistently, basically over the last decade, what I didn't learn enough of, didn't have enough exposure to in my residency was how to deal with all this, this onslaught of behavioral health issues. And I want people just to kind of think when we use the word behavioral health, you know, the conventional stereotypic way people think is it's depression in primary care, anxiety, alcoholism. But if you start thinking about behavioral as any factor, behavioral factor which could influence somebody's current or future health, then we're talking about things like, would you agree that smoking is a behavior? Obesity? Unsafe sexual practices? Chronic pain? And actually, with a joke I have with my residents is, uh, I want you to come back at the end of any practice day and demonstrate to me a case where you did not do a behavior change. And they just laugh because it, it's all about behavior change. Even prescribing somebody a new medicine is changing the behavior, right? So this is in the blood of family medicine, and I think it's becoming more and more recognized that regardless of the setting, if you're going to do this work, you have to be able to change behaviors. And you're never going to learn how to do that because residency programs are lopsided in teaching you technical diagnostic skills. And so the way we can retrofit this is to put you next to a behavioral health consultant who's working side by side and can begin to educate you in how to do these very brief intervention skills. Absolutely, and his residents are saying things like, I will not go to a clinic that doesn't have a behavioral health consultant when they graduate. So get one in yours and you're ahead in terms of recruiting. Um, physicians and PAs and ARNPs to your practice. They'll love it when they hear that. Because uh, it does reduce their workload and um, it does assist them with having stronger relationships with their, their patients. And there's specific things I'll teach the behavioral uh, folks over the week in terms of how to really do this, how you strengthen uh, that relationship and honored that relationship. Um, 
Also, there are some studies out there on behavioral health folks looking at their level of job satisfaction when they work in this position. And this is a study out of California. And um, it was a survey, a mail out survey to people with a master's degree. And so they matched um, kind of the training levels of behavioral health providers with other people. And behavioral health consultants were more satisfied than other people with a variety of master's level degrees. And I, I think this only makes sense, but uh, they did break it down and they said, well, what's most satisfying about your job? And they said, um, I'm appreciated. <laughs> and I mean, uh, you, you know, you think about all the different jobs you've had and how much appreciation. Um, when I was at um, the Toppenish Clinic, I mean, I, I couldn't count the number of times throughout the day that people said thank you to me. I mean, it's, it's like just a hugely reinforcing environment when you're working in this capacity. And the other was uh, being a part of a team, being, feeling like they were part of a team that was working together. So uh, behavioral health folks like it too. So, and as Kirk was saying, reduced healthcare costs, and there's been multiple studies. So um, who, what, when, how, that's, that's the next question. And so new people coming into the primary care uh, clinic um, and we call them behavioral health consultants. Some people call them behaviorists, but we like BHC. So when you see that in the slides, that's what we're talking about, BHC. So BHCF is facilitator, or that's more like the disease management kind of role, the chronic care nurse kind of role. Talk about that in a minute. Uh, BHC CNAs or MAs, hugely important in some settings and trained up um, primary care clinicians in RNs. It's not just about training the behavioral health clinicians, although we want them trained very well because they'll be the ones that train others on the team over time and <coughs> problem solve things. So if you think that it's not a big deal, the training, this, uh, just, I have this one clip. This is Jeff Ryder, a colleague of mine. Uh, from Seattle and his practice. It's just a few minutes. So about how long do you think this anxiety has been a problem for you? Uh, about uh, two months. About two months? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, is it a problem that you've had before? No. No, it's just it's kind of a new problem. Exactly. Yeah. And is it something that that you feel like is really affecting you in significant ways in your in your work? Yes. It is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I have a knock on the door. I'll be out. I'll be gone for just a minute or two. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, while I'm gone, uh, it would be great if you could think a little bit about. Um, Anything that you've done in the past that maybe helps with your anxiety, I'd love, I'd be interested to hear about that when sure. I come back, okay? Sure. Okay, problem. all right, we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Um, I have a patient who's having a lot of trouble with sleeping. Okay. Miss Emily, and I'm wondering if you could meet her and maybe try to squeeze her in today? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah. I could probably see you in about 15 minutes if that works for you. Yeah, I'll be around. Great. I probably only have maybe about 15 minutes or so that we could okay. talk today, but um, that'll at least get us started. That's fine. Okay. All right. Great. We'll pull out the waiting room and he'll come get you. Oh, thank you. All right, I'll see you soon. Okay. So, not necessarily the the.
the way that you would approach things, and yet very important skills in this model. And they, they are skills that really require direct training um, because we're asking folks to do stuff they've never done. In fact, they've been taught not to do, you know. Um, how many, how many of the behavioral health providers in the room were tr given signs that say, in session, do not interrupt when they went through graduate school, right? And uh, of course, PCCs know not to interrupt. So you could even see a little bit of stress on the uh, PCC when she's knocking, <laughs> is it okay? So it does take direct training. And yet it is so important with some patients that we really do need to get the behavioral health provider in the room, making that introduction, getting them to wait 15 minutes. The other thing about this clip is you see that Dr. Ryder was also saying, uh, creating patient expectations. I only have about 15 minutes today because he's, he, he's, he knows his schedule. The schedule for a behavioral health provider is just a starting point. It's not like, um, anything you count on. If somebody's not there within 15 minutes, you take the next person, you know, and sometimes, well, Kirk can tell you, sometimes he'll have five referrals in two hours, and he adjusts, he adjusts to, to get the people seen. Mm -hmm. What is your active definition of a behavioral health consultant? It's a, that's a great question. Um, it's a licensed provider and um, that provides PCBH services. And you're right on point with me explaining that <laughs> in detail. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here is Mary Virginia. Uh, she's a woman I trained, works in a pediatric primary care clinic with eight pediatricians. Um, takes my, they, most of the, um, underinsured, um, uninsured kids in Yakima County. Anyway, so this is the introduction. This is the way we teach behavioral health consultants to introduce themselves. So Mary Virginia says, I'm the clinic's BHC and my job is to help, and this is the introduction to the patient, okay? Because we're looking at patient-centric, <laughs> patient point of view. Uh, to help your PCC help you, okay? So they're in that consultation role. They're reporting to the PCC and they're consulting to help um, the patient, uh, the PCC help the patient. Uh, your PCC calls me in to help when there's a concern about mental, physical, or social health. So a BHC is someone that helps with physical, mental, or social health. So, addresses, mm -hmm. sure. If we could ask a couple of kind of pragmatic questions. Yes. So, do these folks like, so where do they see the patients? Do they have their own practice plans? Do they see them in the primary care mm -hmm. physician's office? And, and how, do you, how are you paying for this? <laughs> oh, well, my, my sponsors will talk about the payment thing, but uh, I, I can definitely. How are you paying? How is, how's the visit paid for? How's the visit paid for? Well, I, I will say that Payment strategies include billing and recommend use the health and behavior codes. Uh, they're paid in Oregon. And more details on that this afternoon, but just to take a question why it's hot. And then there's also to look at the cost offset. So cost offset would be things like improving access to medical visits and, and billing uh, at a higher level for medical visits. They have their own practice plan. They have their own. Um, they have their own rooms. No, not necessarily. That that's quite yeah. Back to the practical kinds of questions. Um, they can sit in a nursing station. We want them in the heart of the clinic, and they can be assigned to different exam rooms to see patients one morning and one afternoon. A different. That's you see Mary Virginia there. What she's holding is a basket of toys for children. And so she sits in an office with two PAs um, in back uh, in a hallway. There's three hallways of exam rooms and she's right there. So um, 
she, when she's called out, she just grabs her basket and computer and goes into the exam room. I think we're, we're, maybe you're going to get to this uh -huh. later, but like in a, in a fee-for-service model, this sounds like it's just from a business standpoint, not, not from a healthcare standpoint, it sounds like from a business model, it's tying up an exam room for a larger amount of time. So in a, in a primary care environment, under fee-for-service, that, that would be a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it really uh, depends on your system. You may want to have an office. I mean, if you have, it's kind of like this. If you have more offices than you do exam rooms, that great. Put the BHC in an office. But if you don't, I mean, it's, it's different. I mean, I've seen BHCs kind of hang out in treatment rooms or procedure rooms, you know, because they tend to be underused. <laughs> it, but wherever they can be, that's where they go. They don't require a lot in terms of space. They don't need a sink room. Yeah. But they can work in one. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned this is a licensed clinician. So licensed, can you give some examples of what they are licensed in? Like is this a licensed counselor? Is this a licensed social worker? What is this? All of those. And, and PhD, psychologist or PsyD. Okay. <laughs> marriage and family therapist, I think that's what Mary Virginia is. Of course, you know, that, that kind of also touches upon billing issues, you know, so you have to kind of figure that into the mix, but in a, in a general way, it's a licensed provider. They're not like a psychiatrist or a licensed nurse practitioner? You know, very few psychiatric nurse practitioners are, um, psychiatrists end up being BHCs because they cost too much and um, they can do things that generate more money by working in a different role. Uh, also, they tend to have less training that would support success in the BHC role. But that, I, I'm saying that's, that's a generalization. I've trained one psychiatric nurse provider that I think is just awesome. She never prescribes and she just does BHC work and loves it. It's, it's a matter of what your resources are. And I mean, I say skills rather than discipline when it, it comes to BHC work, general guideline. And you can train a lot. So I'm from LTC, I work at um, Portland Integrative and um, I noticed half an hour Typically, I see clients for an hour. Session. Yeah. So I'm wondering, and I know Kirk, you see 14 clients a day. That suggests about a half an hour split. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Let me get to it and talk about the components. That I would say that is the most difficult, probably single transition that behavioral health providers have to make to come into this model, is is going from an hour to 30 minutes. Um. Okay, so job as a consultant, spending about a half hour. So uh, also typical introduction, so part of how you get to a half hour is tell the patient it's a half hour. And then you're creating different patient expectations. And we'll come up with a plan, I'll share it with your PCC. Some people come back to see me to learn more skills. So you're also in that introduction, you're saying, hey, you may just see me one time. That gives people huge permission to change. And it's like very engaging, you know. It, I mean, it, it really is a very hope building thing to say to somebody. Maybe we can fix this thing right now. That's what Mary Virginia says. Um, and then she says, okay, let's start with a brief survey. It'll give us numbers about your quality of life over the past week. And she'd probably say, and if you come back, I'll ask these questions again, and we'll look at them to see if our plan is working. So it's an outcomes-based practice. Um, it's a practice that targets a single problem. That's the problem that's of concern to that patient that day. Okay, her assumptions about behavior change are that maladaptive behaviors are learned 
and maintained by various external and internal factors, and many maladaptive behaviors occur as a result of skill deficits. The patient doesn't know what else to do. They don't have any other skills. So a lot of BHC work is about skills and about exploring these maladaptive behaviors. And what we know is that direct behavior change is the most powerful form of human learning. So her services include brief intervention services. So these are the 30, 15 to 30 minute visits, most often on the same medical day, usually complete an episode, we say an episode of care in four or less visits. But there are what we call continuity visits, and that may be as many as 20 to 40% of the visits of a BHC, depending upon the population served. Continuity visits are with people um, that truly need more behavioral health support than in, in order to kind of get any kind of movement on medical problems. So that would be like, uh, the person with diabetes with a huge amount of psychosocial stress and really weak uh, self-management skills. So you'd see them on a continuous basis. You might see them every other week for four or five months to get some momentum going and you're shifting the burden from uh, the uh, PCC uh, to the behavioral health provider. A lot of your follow-up visits and these continuity visits are more like 15 minutes, not 30 minutes. So continuity visits also provides workshops, classes. Given the magnitude of people we're going to have coming into primary care and our shortage of PCCs, we're going to have to do more workshops, more classes. And that, you know, the topics really depend upon, again, your population. The other thing she provides are pathway services. So uh, pathway services are based on um, an identified patient population. Could be diabetes, could be chronic pain. So it's more of a vertical integration strategy and I'll give you an example of that momentarily. Want to mention Mary Virginia's helpers in terms of the PCBH model. So you might have the facilitator, which is the disease manager um, kind of person, uses a roster, does a lot of phone work, uh, addresses um, uh, medical medication adherence and supports behavior change plans often developed by the behavioral health consultant. Staffs patients with a behavioral health consultant usually on a weekly basis and may assist with workshops, classes, group medical visits, that sort of thing. So has clinical role in the clinic. BHC assistant is another potential role. When I was at Farm Workers and I had 17 FTE providers and one BHC, very, very lean staffing for a behavioral health consultant. Um, I had an assistant, a full-time assistant that worked like an MA or CNA just for my practice and did all of these things. So uh, managed patient flow, obtained the outcome information, prior to the visit, you know, stayed on the schedule, stocked uh, patient education materials in the clinic, uh, main connect uh, maintained connections with community uh, resources, telephone call checks to patients. Um, and in some clinics, um, the um, BHC assistant can be uh, a language and culture broker for the behavioral health consultant. These are the components, and that's what we train on uh, Tuesday through Friday, the components, and it's getting the components down that really helps you um, move from 60 minutes to uh, 30 minutes. So the components are physician refers, then the BHC does the introduction. It'll be a very strange thing for a lot of the behavioral health providers to memorize an introduction and then to be timed and giving it <laughs> but that is a specific skill and very important to success in terms of making that transition from 60 to 30 minutes. Uh, it uses an outcome assessment along with that introduction. That's the first five minutes. The snapshot 
five minutes. That's the psychosocial history that sometimes is 13 pages long in a mental health setting. Um, and then uh, functional analysis or target problem analysis, more looking at the ABCs or the behavioral context of the problem. Uh, problem summary and then creating, you know, doing some skill training, creating a, a behavior change plan, charting and giving feedback to the PCC. Um, patient goes out, practices, recommended skills, and implements plan and comes back as need be. What's really nice about this model is there's no opening or closing cases. You just see the patient when they need to be seen and you see them throughout the lifetime. So I would see someone maybe when they were 13 because they were fighting with their parents and then I'd see them uh, two years later, they were fighting with their boyfriend. And then I'd see them uh, when they were pregnant with their first child, you know, three years later. And you know, it's an open door in a continuing relationship but it's not continuing therapy throughout that time. A lot of things are integrated into this model that are based on evidence in terms of that, the structure of the interview. So we use things like behavioral health prescription pads. Um, the toolkit that you'll learn about this afternoon has tons of evidence-based protocols that the behavioral health uh, trainees will be trained on this week. This is an example of a um, behavioral health prescription pad, so it's evidence, you know, suggests that if we write things down or have our patients write things down, have them bring them back, follow up on specific behavioral plans. We have a variety of these different forms that we'll share with you in training. Pathway services are, you know, that's targeting a specific population. One of the first things you do if you're going to create a pathway is you say, well, what are we doing for those patients now, say chronic pain patients? What are we doing and what are our outcomes and how do we know those outcomes? And then you say, what is the evidence? And you match the evidence to your resources. You can't do everything you could and a lot of things you can't do, but there are some things you can do. So you get it started in a way that systematically uses your behavioral health consultant resource. So it could be assessment, intervention, a monthly group service, a, a workshop, very uh, um, versatile kind of approach. So it can include screening, one-on-one -on -one, uh, classes or workshops, um, group medical visits, and coordination of um, uh, for example, the facilitator. So step up, step down, step in. A lot of folks just don't have a primary care home and we gotta pull them in so we can create pathways that help with that. Um, this is an example of a uh, pathway for chronic pain patients. So the uh, PCC enrolls the patient, completes the pain agreement, refers to the BHC for a same day. Um, orientation visit, and then monitors and updates the treatment plan. The BHC orients the patient to the class, uh, does an opioid risk assessment, um, has monthly class meetings uh, where they measure and chart outcomes that help the team evaluate um, the impact of their treatment. Um, three strikes program is just if people have violations in their agreement, the BHC sees them uh, more frequently, uh, supplements with individual visits, so it's not push them away, but pull them in. And then the RN has various roles in terms of maintaining a registry, um, working with uh, PCPs on medications uh, prior to uh, the monthly group. Um, example of kind of the quality of life class agenda for you behavioral health folks that are saying, what do you do with a whole room of patients with chronic pain? <laughs> How long is that class? <laughs> and it's just an hour, so we can do it. And um, you get to know these people and they get to know you. This, this approach actually has been evaluated by patients, they like it better, and by uh, uh, 
the uh, providers. In year one, able, they said uh, they were more able to access, access effective programs. Year four, have skills to work effectively. So it's that training effect, you know, through reading the BHC chart notes, those curb um, side consultations, just talking briefly, uh, the little brief presentations at lunch meetings. Five, I usually have a new idea about how to help my most difficult patients. So the other thing the BHC can help you do in terms of pathway work is to, to look at the other end of the spectrum, and that's the prevention spectrum. Uh, so the other end of pain and quality of life pathway looks at how are all these people following, falling into that river. Um, so calls for the PCC to do a risk assessment at four to eight weeks after injury and to use that uh, prescription pad I showed you a while ago, the love, work, and pay, play prescription pad to shift the conversation from pain elimination and prescribing to return to a higher quality of life and pain acceptance. Uh, the BHC uh, can follow up on the start uh, by the uh, PCC developing committed action plan, working with family, get them on board. And um, if, it's, if they are not uh, improved, then they can come into the uh, pain and quality of life program at three months rather than at 17 years and after multiple back surgeries. So, so much we can do.